<sighs> another day, another tiger tank to build. Yeah, I know. It's just, you know, how many have I done by now? I mean, they're cool, but, you know, it's just, I need something a little bit more refreshing occasionally. Anyway, let's just go ahead and eat our vegetables and get this build out of the way. So, yeah, do me a favor. Reach over in that pile of kits over there and fetch me one of the tiger tank kits. Yeah, yeah, just, just grab any of the tigers. Okay, just throw it on the table. Whoa. Huh. That's a different type of tiger tank. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale US M46 Patton medium tank. The model in this video here is both my own personal collection, it's not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information will be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at EastCoastArmory.com. The model that you see here is built mostly out of the box. However, I went ahead and made some modifications to the build itself, as well as replacing several of the kit components with some aftermarket counterparts. We'll be going over all of these additions in this video, as well as giving this model a thorough in-box review. So stay tuned, because there's going to be a ton of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the M46 Patton. The M46 Patton was a medium tank that was designed by the US military in the years that followed immediately after World War II. Oddly enough, this tank was probably the best medium tank that was designed by the US military during the World War II time frame. But sadly, it didn't enter into service and into production until a year or two after the war actually ended. Obviously, the M46 Patton is heavily influenced and is nothing more an improved version of the M26 Pershing that preceded it. The M26, of course, was a revolutionary tank design designed by the US military during the World War II timeframe and was a complete departure compared to the other vehicles that came before it, namely the Sherman, the Lee, and even, yes, the Stewart. The Pershing was going to be one of the first US tanks to utilize a torsion bar suspension as well as also a rear mounted power pack. Of course, these designs would carry over all the way up until even today on vehicles like the M1 Abrams. However, as revolutionary as the M26 Pershing was, it did have several drawbacks to it, and these were things that hindered its performance. Namely, it was with its design of the engine and with the transmission. The engine utilized was the same engine that was basically used in the M4A3, which was a Ford GAA V8, only the version for the Pershing had slightly more horsepower to it. However, that engine was still underpowered to propel a vehicle with the Pershing's weight. The final drives, as well as the transmission itself, was also something that needed some improvements because this was deemed to be a shortcoming with the design and was also something that led to problems once the tanks were fielded. After the Pershing was fielded and the shortcomings were realized, the engineers hit the drawing board in order to address these problems and get the tank where it needs to be. The first thing that was addressed was with the power pack. The engine was replaced with a brand new V12 gasoline engine from Continental. The Continental engine was far more powerful compared to the Ford GAF and was better suited for propelling a vehicle of this size and weight. The other thing that was also revised was the transmission. It was completely redesigned, and this new transmission was also going to be far more robust in propelling this pattern of vehicle. By changing these two systems, this radically had to alter the tank's design. The engine deck was completely redesigned to a new design that utilized a lot of slat grills. The rear plate was redesigned as well, and of course, so was the final drives. The iconic Pershing's downward sloping track that wraps around the sprocket was replaced with a new higher mounted sprocket that was now in line with the top return rollers. Another interesting bit of engineering that was incorporated in the design was the addition of a trailing idler. This was a tiny little torsion bar with a small little return roller that was fixed to it and this put constant pressure on the rear portion of the track and this was designed in order to keep the track at the proper tension and to prevent it from throwing during operation. 
Outside of these automotive changes, the remainder of the vehicle was basically left as the standard M26. The front section was left unaltered, the turret was unaltered, and so was the main armament. The vehicle, for all intents and purposes, was still a Pershing, which is why, in my opinion, this vehicle really should have been designated as the M26A2. However, for one reason or another, they decided to go ahead and designate this new vehicle as a brand new class of tank and it was going to be named the M46 and at this time they decided to name the tank after George S. Patton who of course recently passed away and in honor of his legendary service this tank's family was going to bear his name. The vehicle entered service with the U.S. military in 1949 and stayed in service up until 1957. Although this tank was still fairly new, not a whole lot of them were built, a little over a thousand in change. Because as revolutionary or as perfected as this vehicle was, by the time this vehicle actually began seeing service in the 1950s, armored development has preceded it and this vehicle was quickly becoming obsolete. This vehicle would eventually be replaced by the M47, then even more quickly by the M48 during this time frame. At this point here, this vehicle was just going to be relegated more towards secondary service, being primarily used by National Guard as well as Army Reserves. Although this vehicle's service life was somewhat limited with the U.S. military, it did have its 15 minutes of fame, and that was during the Korean War. This vehicle was sent along with the M26 Pershing family and the M4A3 E8 to the Korean Peninsula, where it was used to great effect to deal with the communist T-3485, as well as also the other armor threats that were utilized by the North Koreans, as well as the Chinese. Both the Pershing and the Patton were more than capable at dealing with these armor threats. As noteworthy as the M46 performance was in Korea, that's not what made the vehicles infamous. That was going to be how they were painted. You see, at some point in the war, it was deemed that the North Korean and the Chinese soldiers were superstitious. So if they paint their tanks to look like tigers, they're going to be ferocious and the enemy are going to be afraid of them. If that worked or not, who knows. However, it was definitely a morale boost for Allied troops and was something that was done to great effect on a large number of American tanks. The M46 Patton was one of the more noteworthy ones. These vehicles had a very beautiful paint job applied to them where the whole front portion of the tank was painted yellow and they had stripes and tiger faces painted on them. This led to a very unique era in U.S. military history and it's one that hasn't really been replicated ever since. It is the M46 Patton in Korea with this configuration which is something that cemented this vehicle and really prevented it from just being any other vehicle with a short-lived lifespan as several other vehicles in history have been. Before we go any further, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the project. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this vintage 1990s Dragon M46 patent kit. This kit here is another really, really, really cool kit from the 1990s era that has magically aged superbly well. The M46 kit from Dragon was one of those really cool releases that stunned everybody and was one that took the industry almost like a decade later in order to catch up to. This kit here was actually part of a three vehicle series. Dragon went ahead and tooled up not only the M46, but they first tooled up the T26 E3 Pershing and the M26 A1 Pershing. The patent here was basically just the last leg of the family and all three kits came out around the same time in the mid 1990s period. I want to say 94, 95 or so. Again, this was one of those childhood builds that I always wanted to get my hands on, but for a few reasons, I always avoided like the plague, but finally, I'm able to go ahead and get this one started and it will be good to finally add this one to the collection. This model here, I picked up off of eBay about eh, two years ago or so. So, you know, it's been sitting in the stash ever since. Yep, we got some shop dust on the surface, but again, that's no longer going to be the case. The kit here has been out of production now for a long time. This kit, along with the other Persian kits, have been periodically re-released by Dragon 
over the last number of decades or so. And when they release them, they make some changes. One of the recent releases, I believe, was a Cyber Hobby exclusive, and it's this same kit here, only they fix one of the biggest issues with the kit, if you know what I'm saying, by giving you a more modern set of track. However, instead of tracking that one down, I wanted the original OG old school kit, and the reason why I wanted it was for nostalgia, but also was because of this killer box art. This box art is awesome, which I'll be touching upon in a second. One thing that was really cool about the Dragon Pershing and M46 Patton family of kits is that, unlike the other kits that Dragon were tooling up at this time, which were borrowing components from Italeri, say on their Sherman kits or their Panther kits, the Patton or the Pershing family kits was all 100% original Dragon tooling. And the tooling on these kits here are superb. These kits are excellent. Even how old they are, they have aged so remarkably well. And you will see that once I crack the box open. Now, at the moment, I've built the Pershing kits from Dragon. And I also built a the Pershing family kits from Tamiya. And I gotta say, compared side by side, the Dragon kits are actually better, which is amazing considering how old this tooling is. And it just, you know, it's a testament just how good they came out. Since this kit here, and by the way, it's a other thing I want to touch upon. This was the first M46 Patton in the modern era. The only other M46 kit out there was the one from Limburg that came out in the 50s and or the 60s, and that one was more or less designed to be a motorized toy. Still a real cool model in its own right, but if you wanted an M46 Patton to do something with the Korean War or similar, you were screwed. There was no other kits on the market for that. It's not like you could even find a Persian kit to retrofit into an M46 because there weren't even any Persian kits at this period. Dragon went ahead with the release of these three models over here. It really was a huge, huge benefit to the hobby. But the newest comer to the M46 Racket has been TACOM with their M46 Patton release. That's again another interesting kit I wanted to also do a review on. But again, that's for a future video down the road. For this particular kit here, this is again something that I've always wanted to do. So anyway, starting with the box art and the graph design, here we have obviously a Korean War Tiger Face M46 Patton right here in the foreground. And this illustration here is excellent. I'm not sure who the artist was who did this illustration. Generally, Dragon likes to use Vince or Ronald Volset specifically during this era. However, I don't exactly see any signatures on the composition, so perhaps it might have been cropped out. Regardless, whoever this illustrator was, was on point because this illustration is gorgeous. Admittedly, it's not as gorgeous as the Tamiya Korean War Sherman box art from the 70s, but you know, that's I'm, I'm a bit biased, that is my favorite box art of all time. But anyway, we have here the M46 firing off a 90 millimeter, and then you have two other M46s in a row about to do the same. The quality of the illustration is excellent. The details are very nicely rendered out. You can see the tool rack over here. The canvas has all of its nice rendering on it. The faces on the individuals in the composition are great. Again, it's just a gorgeous box art all the way around. For the typography, we have here the name of the vehicle in question. And what's interesting is that this was part of Dragon's 135th scale Korean War series. And this was a really short-lived series that Dragon had. They never really expanded it too much. They released about, I wanna say, under a dozen kits for this line, which would include this M46 Patton, the M26A1 Pershing, as well as, I believe, a few Russian pattern of vehicles, like a, a ISU-152, the SU-76, and I think a T-34 in that lineup. But regardless, the Korean War line has not been added to really ever since the, I want to say, the 1990s period, and it's kind of a derelict, abandoned series that Dragon does have. It's in the shadow, of course, of 39 to 45, which, you know, they're always making kits in that. Anyway, the side tab here will show the typography for the Korean War series. So here we have a thumbnail of the vehicle in question, you know, quite customary, but this is where it gets different with the remainder of the graphic design here. First, the Korean War series has this banner running across this section with the dual color. We have here the kit 
number, which is 6805, and it's in an oval. And the remainder of the graphic design is with this beige, teal type uh, green coloring. Of course, the Dragon logo is right there on the bottom. On this side here, we have some corporate information, barcode, all that good stuff. Same info reverse on the opposite tab. And here we have a nice thumbnail here or of sample images of one of the built models. And I gotta say, the guy who built this model here did an excellent job with the paintwork. I love the yellow accents used on the wheels and the hubs. It's really cool, nicely done overall. This kit does give you an option to render it either with the tiger face or you could render it with the other USMC option with the uh, the searchlight here mounted over the the mantlet, which is going to be really, 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 really uh, trying for me because I would love to build it with that searchlight because it just it's a nice, really cool bit of detailing. However, this one here is getting tiger face, so you know uh, this one here is just going to be relegated to the spare bin. Perhaps I'll dust it off and use it on a future build down the road, but you know. Who knows when that's going to come. Anyway, here's the copyright. Again, 1995 was when these models came out. And let's go ahead without further ado and crack the model open. Okay, first I want to point out that I believe that this is all plastic. There's no photo etch or any other type of other amenities found in this kit. It's all old school injection molded plastic. The plastic used is the plastic that Dragon utilized on their kits from this era, which of course, if anyone knows the thing about Dragon kits, Dragon themselves changed the polystyrene used for their injection molds as time went on. On the older kits here, this is generally how they look and feel. Starting right off the bat, we have here the components for the turret. And the turret here is probably one of the best features found on this kit. If you look closely, you can see the molded and cast texturing, and it is just really nicely rendered. If we compare other kits of the period, such as Tamiya, for instance, where, yeah, a lot of their kits had molded and cast texturing too. The problem is with the Tamiya cast texturing, it was so finely molded that after the model gets painted with a coat of primer and even just with the base coat, it basically becomes smooth. With the Dragon cast texturing here, it's much more aggressive, and because of that, it holds up better to layers of paint. The cast texturing is found throughout the turret section, so over here and also on the mantlet. The mantlet rotor system is very nicely rendered with all of its fastener details present, as well as, again, more cast texturing. Here you can see the tin work. Now, I believe this is for the Pershing, so this one here may not be getting these type of fenders, but actually this is from the Pershing, it's from the M26A1 specifically because of the later 90mm with the bore evacuator. Two-piece barrel assembly, you know, quite customary around these builds. And again, the detailing is generally nicely done. By the way, I've actually built an example of the Dragon M26A1, and that can also be found on the ECA channel. Next sprue is this set that we have here, which is specific for the M46, because it gives you those really large pan exhaust muffler manifolds that are found on the back. We also have here some searchlight details and the remainder of the searchlight. It's a multi-part assembly, which means you would have a lot of seams to contend with, but for this build here, that's not something I'm going to need to worry about. We have here two of the MG pinnel mounts. The one is for the Commander pinnel mount, while the second one is the standard US AFV collapsing one. And Dragon on this kit went ahead and molded it with the rubber cap fitted in place. Nice little bit of detailing that 90% of people probably miss during paint work, but again, I'll touch upon that as the video goes on. We have some suspension components. Note the details here on the spring system. Just really nicely rendered. Next runner is the upper hull, and here you get to see the same type of fittings or details found on the other sections of the build. There is cast texturing found here on the front. It's not as aggressive as the one on the turret admittedly, but still should clean up pretty well. We have the correct square type air filter section here, which is something found on the M26A1 and the M46. The grill work is very, very nicely rendered. All the hinges and handles are present. And the Manifold intakes are extremely nicely rendered out. 
Again, considering the age of this tooling and with the current kits on the market, you can see exactly what I mean when I'm talking about how well this kit aged. I mean, this is something that you would see basically on contemporary kits of this era. In fact, the Dragon M48A1 has basically the same type of barbecue grill that we have here. Here we got some more tin work. We have here a little piece for the underhull. Look, it has all of the molded in access panels present. Nice touch. We have another mantlet. This one here, I think, has the cutouts for the searchlight. Tin work looks to be really nicely detailed. We have the rear plate here with the brush guards integrally molded on, telephone box, and more access hatches. All the details are present, including fasteners, hinges, pins, you name it. You get to see the rear section of the hull. With the way the kit is molded, it is a multi-part assembly to assemble that rear section over there, but from what I've seen on the other M26, it should go together without any problems. Next runner is the running gear. So we have all of the wheels that are present. They have their hubcaps integrally molded on. And with the way the pieces are designed, once you glue the the cap over it, or I should say the front portion of the rim over it, it blends in perfectly from my experience. We have a loose little swing arm over here. Of course, the swing arms are separately molded pieces, as are the eilers and all the other components. One thing that I guess shows its age a little bit is with the sprockets. Note it has an internal cruciform type brace for molding. This is something that appears to be a bit on the chunkier side and will require a little bit of care by the builder to thoroughly remove and also polish down. This is something that is generally not seen too much these days, but to be fair, I have seen or run across this type of a setup on other Dragon kits, namely, well, the M60 and the, M and the M48 family of kits. They do have something very similar to this, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be dusting off those techniques on this one here, but more information on that is to come. We also have on the same runner the little brush guards. I mean, this is something that it's just it's again nice nice detailed components on some kits these would be made out of photo etch on this kit here they are made out of very frail thin pieces of plastic not really sure how easy these are going to be to remove off of the sprue but we'll see how that pans out but as i've stated before you can see how thorough dragon was with this kit this runner here contains more components we have the commander's cupola Note the detailing molded into the periscopes, as well as the overall geometry itself. We have the bow hatches, loader hatch, bow brush guards. This one here appears to have a little bit of damage done to it, probably from all the years of clunking around. And this one here is, appears to be a little bit worse off. See how that pans out. I may actually have a few spares of these on hand, so we'll see how that. How that goes together. One thing that I always loved on these older Dragon kits is the M2HB. As you can see, it is very, very nicely detailed. And one thing I always thought was cool was Dragon rendered it with the ladder sight in the up position. The M2 is a single molding, so no halves to be found. And the only thing you have to add in the back are the but or the the grips. But you can see the butterfly system present, and again, very nicely molded considering, even again, the age of this tooling. Here we have the lower hull. This is a recycled part and is found on all of their Pershing family of kits. It's a nice bit of tooling. In fact, as a quick ECA side note, I actually used the M26A1 kit uh, when I was referencing and building my 1.6 scale T26 E3 Pershing, and many of the Measurements and details found on that model were basically measured off of this particular tooling here. So you can see the escape hatch, torsion bar mounts, fasteners all present, and this is that section where that plate drops into place. So if you haven't been able to guess yet, I am a huge fan of the Dragon Pershing family kits, and I love them. The detailing on them is great, subject matter is awesome, and they're just very well executed. And then we get to the kryptonite. This was what prevented me from buying and building this kit 
all of those years ago. And if, of course, anyone's a fan of the channel, you'll know exactly why, and because that's found with this cancer right over here. Lincoln Link tracks, of course. This kit here has individual Lincoln Link tracks. And they're garbage. They literally ruin the model. This is the number one hurdle that was just ruining this model kit for me. And not just me, basically everyone else, because spoiler alert, no one re is really that good at putting these together. I don't care what anyone says, these tracks are garbage. Even Dragon themselves realized that these tracks suck so much that when they re-released these kits here in the 2010 time frame, they re-released them with the single piece vinyl tracks that are from the T28 Super Heavy Tank. And those are excellent tracks and that was wisely done. I could go into more depth about the tooling of these tracks here, how they are a two piece assembly, you have the track link itself along with the teeth and then they get glued on separately and basically these are almost identical to the HVSS tracks that Dragon had of the period, but just like those tracks of the period, they're garbage and I ain't using them. So in their place, because I actually have a brain stem, I'm going to be replacing them with a set of workable track links from AFV Club. And uh, did, you, did you just hear that, that groan? Yes, because these tracks here have a really, really poor reputation to them by the modeling community. However, that reputation is because of several individuals' inability to adapt these tracks to make them work for them. Now, in addition to this video over here, I'm actually going to have a companion video where I show the assembly of these tracks and show how they get assembled, how to properly assemble them, and assemble them in a way that you're not gonna break anything. Because that was really the problem that these tracks had. The material was very frail on them, and if you try to just assemble them with the out of the box method, you're going to end up breaking a lot of links. And this led for a lot of people getting disgruntled with these tracks and giving them the poor reputation. These tracks themselves have been around since the early 2000s. So good on AAV Club. And they've kept them in production all along. For the longest period of time, these were the only aftermarket tracks. I'm going to leave that in the video. These are the only aftermarket tracks that were available for the Patton or the Persian family of kits for the longest time. A few years later, I believe Bronco would come out with a set of tracks of the same pattern. However, the Bronco tracks from what I've seen look basically similar in complexity as these ones over here. So perhaps I'll do a review on the Bronco ones down the road, but for this kit here, I'm gonna roll with the A of V Club ones. I also use the A of V Club ones on not just my, T my Accurate Armor T28 Super Heavy Tank, but I also use them on my other Dragon M26A1 Pershing. But more information on that is to come. I will briefly open up the box to show what the tracks look like, in case anyone hasn't seen them before. Here go the components, they're molded in this brown plastic. Now they are plastic, a lot of people out there claim that these are resin, that's not the case, they are plastic. It's just that they're very frail plastic and are easily broken. For this kit, I went with the T80E1 track, which is the steel chevron version, but they also have the rubber chevron version as well, and it's your personal choice. For this build here, I'm gonna go with the steel one because you know it's akin to the box art, and most of the patterns that I've seen in theater tend to have the steel track as opposed to the rubber block ones, but more information on that can be discussed in the comments below. So on the very bottom of the box, we have here a really cool painting guide. This is something that Dragon used to do a lot during this era where we had a separate print of just, you know, different options how to paint and mark the vehicle. Nothing on the opposite side, but here you get to see the two options available. We have standard USMC with the USMC green and the searchlight, and then we have the Chad Tiger Face M46. Aside from the painting guide, we have the instructions right here. In quite typical dragon format of this period. Yeah, I'm not gonna be following that at all. Um, here you can see the instructions. The instructions are pretty well thought out. I like the way they remind you not to have the teeth on the sprocket canted so that the track actually plugs into their appropriate locations. Even with workable tracks, that's something that is very important. More so, I would say. But you can get to see the type of quality found on the illustrations. Generally, these illustrations from the other Dragon kits of this period were pretty good by and large. But again, if there's any sort of mishaps or mistakes, I'll gladly point those out as the video moves on. 
One thing that's quite refreshing is that you'll be using just about all of the components on this kit. There's only a few pieces that are blued out, which is quite refreshing considering if anyone has built a modern dragon kit, basically the whole thing is blue. It looks like one of those funny Freedom of Information Act type <laughs> declassified documents where it's all blacked out. But that's it for the instructions. And on the bottom here, we have a set of water slide decals. And this is something that's really interesting. Unlike other Korean War kits where the markings were something that you, the builder, were gonna be on your own hand painting, for this one over here, they supplied you with many of the markings in decal format. This is something I'm a little bit on the fence over. I did the Korean War Dragon Sherman kit a little while ago, and on that one, they also give you the mouth supplied. However, if you saw that video, you'll see that I actually didn't use it, and I just painted my own mouth on for several reasons. For this one here, we have the mouth, the claws, the whiskers, the eyes, some stripes. I may give it a shot to see how it pans out. I think it should work out pretty good. The decal quality is always excellent on these 90s era dragon kits. It's just that when it comes to tiger facing, I generally like to paint them. Just gives it more veritas, I should say. But, you know, we'll see how that pans out. And here's the model in the early phase of construction. And at this point here, I want to take a moment to point out some of the features that I personally love on these dragon pattern of M26 and M46 vehicles, which really were ahead of their time and why this kit here is still as relevant today as it was all those years ago. So at this point here, the hull and the turret main sections have been fully assembled. And this is one unique aspect of this kit. And it's something that you don't really see on some of the other kits on the market. The one that comes to my attention is the Tamiya one. On the Tamiya Pershing kit, basically the kit has the tin work already pre-integrally molded on and the upper and lower hulls go together you know, you have the basic shape of the vehicle. Well, with the Dragon one here, it's more representative of the real vehicle. And you can see that now with the hull in its assembled state and also with the turret for that matter this is basically the bare bones of this pattern of vehicle and of course i'm using the term pershing and patent intermixed with each other because the same feature obviously is found on the dragon m26 kit as well so here you get to see what it looks like with the tin work absent and without the tin work here the patent and the Pershing, for that matter, are very, very different compared to when it looks like fully assembled. With that tin work in place, it really does throw everything off. The hull itself is just made out of a mosaic of some flat plates that are all positioned in a certain manner, then welded together. And the rear section here is really unique because it has this large cast section that has this inlet for the final drives. With the way Dragon rendered this model here, you really, again, get a good feel on this vehicle. And with the way Dragon then renders out the remainder of the suspension and the tin work, it does lend itself for high detail fidelity. This is something that if you integrally mold the fenders on, you lose a little bit of that, but obviously you make up for ease of construction. With the tin work off, this complicates the build a little bit more, but with this type of detail, as a separate piece, you get extra detailing that can't really be rendered if the piece is integrally molded on for one reason or another. What's also interesting to point out that Dragon would go ahead and revisit this type of a layout for rendering a model like this about 20 years later when they would enter into the other post-war American tank kits that were released during those years. Such examples come to mind would be the M103, the M48, and also their M60 series. All of those models have a format similar to this where you have to assemble the hull in sub-assemblies and then the tin work goes on once everything is completed. And just like on those builds, I've said in those videos that it is a fantastic way to go about rendering one of these models because you get extra detail fidelity and also gives you a good appreciation on the complexities on the geometry found on those pattern of vehicles. As for the assembly here, this went together really, really easy and mostly effortlessly. But the way the kit is designed, this whole section here is one integral molding. This bottom plate here is a separate piece as it's different on the M26 kit and this being the 46 kit has a 
bunch of different features found on the bottom portion here. And this back area is a mosaic where it's comprised of about three or four components that get assembled in a sub-assembly and then secured to the rear portion of the hull. To do this, the parts do go together pretty well. There's no real hand fitting that's required. However, there is some seam work that the builder does have to contend with. The seam work was plugged up with some thick super glue and once the CA set, I went ahead and polished it down with some sandpaper, both dry and wet. Then once the areas were sanded down, I went ahead and then assembled the upper hull. Once the upper hull goes on, it then gets a second barrage of bodywork. And this would include all of these areas over here where the upper makes contact with the lower. And I also went ahead and added a second batch of super glue here to those other areas just to refine them even more thoroughly. The sanding was done again with the sandpaper both wet and dry and it did a pretty good job with blending everything in. On this area over here there was a somewhat deeper valley that was present and this was just plugged up with some red putty as it was a bit too too much of a job to do with just super glue alone. So a little smear of red putty were added to these two locations and then once the putty set again just some sandpaper was done to refine it fuller. Once that was complete the hull at this point here is ready for the next step. Also one thing to keep in mind of with these Dragon M46s is that there are several locations found on the lower plate here that you need to drill out with a pin vise prior to the upper hull getting fitted to the lower. These are marked in the instructions, however this is something that can easily be glossed over so you want to pay attention when you're working on one of these builds. On the M46 here there are these two holes right over there and there are other two holes that need to be drilled out in these areas. Again these are very well marked on the kit's tooling itself, but you have to drill them out prior to the upper hull getting uh, fixed on. There are also some other holes that are present on the lower section here that do not need to be drilled out if you're working on the M46, and this is again something you have to pay attention to, because if you have the pin vise and you could just be going, you know, crazy with drilling out all these sections, if you do that, you're going to have a problem. I mean, it's not, a, it's not like a deal breaker, you just got to do a little bit of body work and plug them up, but it's best left to take your time so you don't have to do extra body work that you really don't need to do. On the turret itself, these went together like a dream. Like I said before, these kits are just excellent with their fitting and with their details. The seam line was plugged up with some thick super glue and I did the stepling technique the same type of technique that I generally use with the red putty, but the same technique could also be done with the super glue if the seam work is very, very mild. And that's what I went ahead and did over here. And this will definitely be more appreciated once the model is fully painted and you'll be able to see it in more depth. But again, it, it's always really cool to take a look at one of these vehicles with the tin work removed. And you can see what it looks like in its bare naked format. The T-55, by the way, is also similar in this regard because of the way the Russians went ahead and designed that vehicle. It was very similar in terms of manufacturing as what the Americans were doing post-World War II. But it's not like anyone ripped off anyone or anything. It's just that's just probably the most easiest and efficient way to produce a vehicle with the tooling that was around at the time. And it's nothing more than a very interesting engineering coincidence. Starting with the Miles running gear, all of the running gear itself outside of the tracks are stock with the Dragon kit and were assembled out of the box without any sort of problems. The Dragon running gear assembles very, very easily and also pretty much effortlessly. The parts fit together very well and there's not really a whole lot of hand fitting that needs to be done on both the swing arm components as well as also for the wheel assemblies themselves. Probably the trickiest component on the entire suspension to assemble were the sprockets. As I touched upon before in the unboxing section, the sprockets have this little cruciform reinforcement section that's molded in the inner portion here of the drum. This is something that could potentially give the builder some difficulties if they do not have the tools or the the skill sets required in order to get rid of that part and get rid of it cleanly. Something like this can potentially be removed with a clean cut snip, however in my opinion that's not really the best procedure for this application. The problem with the clean cut snips is that one they're not really long enough to go into the section over here and also with the thicknesses of the part the clean cut snip can potentially cause harm to the shape of the drum itself due to the stress being exhibited on the plastic when snipping away these pieces. Instead what I went ahead and did was I utilized a Dremel with a router bit. The micro router bits are found via the link listed below to the following vendor where it's the 
usual location where I purchase all of my router bits as well as also my micro bits from. However, what the router bit was able to do was I was able to eat away the center portion of the cruciform. Once that chunk of plastic was deleted, I was able to remove the, rem the last remaining sections with a half round needle file. After a few passes with the needle file, I was able to thoroughly polish away any sort of remembrance, deburring the sprocket thoroughly, leaving for the, the appearance that we have here. Once the sprocket sections were cleaned up, they were simply assembled out of box and they went on the model without any problems. The other thing to pay attention to, and this is extremely important, so much so that was even mentioned in the instructions, is again with the alignment of the sprocket teeth. With the way these sprockets are designed, there's no like key and socket type format, and because of that, you can mount the sprocket teeth on in a cockeyed manner. If you do this, it's going to be a nightmare when it comes time to fit on the track. The track obviously needs to time perfectly with the teeth, and this can't be done if the teeth are off center. So when you're building one of these models, pay extreme attention to the teeth, make sure that they time properly. If they do, your build will definitely be able to be assembled and be completed in a much more streamlined manner. One other thing I want to mention about the wheels is with the installation. This is something that's a little bit different compared to anyone who's used to working on, say, a Tamiya M48 Patton or either one of the M60 kits that are from Tamiya and or Academy, where, you know, the wheels are glued together and you basically just plug them on and snap the track on in place. On this kit over here, it's going to be a different procedure, even though design-wise, the suspension is very similar. And this has to do with the assembly of the track. As I mentioned before, and I'm going to touch upon in a second, the track obviously is not the kit supply track. Instead, I replaced it with a set of workable links. Well, with the workable links, if anyone will see the video that's going to be posted after this one here where I talk about the assembly of these tracks, you'll see that the mounting of the tracks in the wheels is something that needs to be done in a little bit more of a unique manner compared to what's typically done in most model tank kits. On this one here, it's actually installed much like a German tank where the wheels are installed in layers. By layering the wheels, this will make the installation of the tracks way easier. And this is not just true for the workable track link, but if you're a bonehead and you're going to go with the crappy single piece link in length, which I don't know why you would because that track is absolutely garbage, it still needs to be done with the assembly in the same way with the use of layers. Fortunately, as I touched upon in that other video, the layers go on very, very easily and it does make the installation go by much, much easier. So that is something to keep in mind. As for the paintwork, well, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but I really love how the model is rendered on the box art where we have the sprocket, also the hubcaps, not to mention the return rollers over here painted with the same yellow as the remainder of the tiger face paint job. It just gives the model so much more extra pop and it's something that I eagerly always wanted to do and now finally having the opportunity to have this model in my collection, it's definitely something that it feels good to finally get out of my system. Having said that, it just gives the model so much pop. I am jumping ahead a little bit, but again, it's something that really, really is an eye-catching bit of detailing found on this particular example. And this takes us directly well to the tracks. As I mentioned several times in this video, it would be a cold day in hell before you would ever see me go with any sort of link link tracks on a model tank kit, let alone this example that we have here. So they were promptly pitched and replaced with the Chad workable track links. Of course, these are the AFD Club tracks, and here you get to see what they look like fitted to the model. Of course, I do have a separate video that's going to be posted probably shortly after this one here, where it shows the full assembly and paintwork and installation of these said tracks on this exact same model, so stay tuned for that. But needless to say, that whole myth that the AFE Club tracks are impossible to put together, yeah, I think it's safe to say we could put that to rest. The AFE Club tracks are an excellent addition to any of these single piece, <laughs> link link type track equipped M26 or M46 kits that are on the market, including the TACOM, which was a huge mistake, but that's a rant for another video. Uh, as for this one here, you can see how the track times around the sprocket. It's a perfect fit, and really the AFV Club tracks are probably the more appropriate tracks to mount on one of these older Dragon kits for the simple reason that, well, when these tracks were developed, they were really more or less designed for, frankly, this exact kit here, as this was the only M46 kit that was on the market at that time. Uh, it is important to note that since this kit here, or these tracks have been on the market, there, as the years went on, there have been several other additions to the market in the terms of M26 workable track links of one flavor or another. 
Some other notable examples would be Bronco, and there's also some metal options out there from Fruli, and there's this other company who's out in China. Their name escapes me at the moment, but more or less that may or may not be a topic for another video for another day. Regardless, whatever brand you use, any brand of workable track links is going to be far superior compared to the crap individual link and link tracks that are supplied with this kit. But that's more or less a rule of thumb, regardless on the make and model. Briefly touching upon how the tracks are painted, of course, these are the steel chevron pattern of tracks, and so I went ahead and rendered them in my usual format. The face sections on these tracks would be made out of steel, however, the inner pad sections that make contact with the rubber tires are actually rubber cladded, and if you, or I should say if the lighting works just right, you will see that the color of the track and the color of the rubber are two different types of colors and this is something that is very important because it adds differentiation to the track, adds more contrast to the paintwork and it also makes the build to be that much more realistic. This is a common thing that I mentioned in all these builds rather from World War II all the way up to today as American tracks tend to follow a similar format. Although for this pattern of track here it's again all steel on the face and later designs they would have an all rubber chevron but for this one if you're rendering this pattern of track be it on a Patton, a HVSS Sherman or something similar keep in mind the surface here are made out of metal while the inner portions are made out of rubber so weather accordingly. Moving up takes to the rear plate of the model, and there's nothing really much to talk about here. All of the components that you see fitted to this model are stock, and they just went on without any sort of manhandling or hand fitting required by the builder, i.e. me. What you see is what you get, and basically, like I've touched upon before, these kits are very, very well detailed, and if you just follow the instructions and take your time with the parts, they should go together very well. Of course, as I always mention on these videos, the taillights are appropriately painted, where the one here on the left-hand side is painted with the cat's eye in red, while the one on the opposite side is painted in black. This is something that is always a great way to add a little bit of color contrast to your build, and also, again, adds for more realism, as opposed to just painting them both red, or even worse, leaving them olive drab, which is sadly the case on many, many nice builds that I've seen out there. It's funny how many people screw that up. Or you could do the other mistake where you paint the entire face of the lens itself in red. Keep in mind these are stamped sheet metal and only the glass section would be this tiny little oval section found on the top and a little slit found on the bottom. Everything else would just be standard olive drab. One modification though that I did add to the taillights was the power cable that emerges from the rear portion of the housing and enters into the side portion here of the hull. This was fabricated out of a thin little piece of floor wire where I drilled a small little hole in each of these sections and I just simply connected the wire accordingly. This is an easy way to add a little bit of extra detailing to your build with the minimal amount of effort. Hopping to the front of the model, again, just like with the rear, most of the components that you see here are stock with the kit and were simply assembled out of the box. Where I went ahead and deviated from the kit was I added the small little canister that's found right here on the inner portion of this brush guard, as well as also can be seen on this section right over here. These little cans are absent on the stock kit, and as I mentioned on my Sherman videos, what these little canisters are for are for a plunger to be stowed in this section, generally it's chain retained, and these are used to plug up the hole when the headlight is not fitted in place. Obviously, with the headlight fitted in place, the unit would be stowed in this little section over here. However, the canister would be a piece of detailing that would be found on the brush guard. On the model here, I fabricated my usual format with a thin piece of heat shrink tubing that was shrunk to the appropriate size, and then would just mount it in place. The big difference, however, on the Pershing and Patton or M46 family of vehicles compared to the Shermans is with the location of the canister. On the Sherman, this here, is actually located on the outer portion of the brush guard, while on the Patton and Pershing family, it's located on the inner section. This is something to keep in mind of and something to definitely pay attention to. And of course, once added again, helps to look at the build overall. While on the topic of the brush guards, as I mentioned before during the unboxing, they were a bit damaged from the storage, I guess, from how these things have been packaged all, all those years ago. And fortunately, I was able to simply repair and utilize them on this model. They polished up pretty well, and as you can see, they were able to be installed with absolutely no problems on the model at hand. From there, the remainder of the details that we have in this area here are totally stock, including the 
toe points right there on the lower portion. We have the Browning 1919. The barrel section is drilled out with a small pin vise in order to give you just that little bit of extra detailing. As I often mention, this is a very risky procedure, and if you do not have the tooling nor the skill to go ahead and do this procedure, this is one you might want to sit out because it's better to have the piece molded solid than to potentially damage the MG barrel. Now you're left either with a mutilated piece or you're going to have to track an aftermarket part down, neither of which is really ideal. So the piece here, fortunately, I do have said tooling and skill set, so I went ahead and drilled it out accordingly. The other components are the tool rack, which is a iconic bit of detailing found on this pattern of vehicle. And again, the way the kit is designed, it's very nicely executed. The pieces all line up in their appropriate locations, and once assembled, it gives you the following result. One thing about these tool racks, and something that I always mention on these videos, well, one, Pioneer tools in general are always on my builds, the last thing that gets added to the model just before final completion. And this is not just true for this one here, but it's actually double true because of all the paint work required for the Korean Tiger face. For something like this, yes, the tools cannot be mounted on the model during the paint work because good luck trying to get in here and paint all that intricate mouth area with the tools just stuck in place. So definitely pump your brakes during a build like this, paint the tools off hand, and then secure them on when the time does come. As for painting the tools, like I, again, frequently mention, you have some options available to the builder as these tools were in a multitude of different configurations in real life. Sometimes the tools were just painted in overall olive drab and other times they were more left in, well, some natural coloring. This is up to the discretion of the builder and either way will still be suffice. The one thing you want to pay attention to is not necessarily the tools themselves but are the straps. Straps are integrally molded in, a lot of people tend to forget that and they just simply omit that paintwork on their model. Painting the straps is a super easy thing to do. Once done, it just amplifies the build that much more and you're not really doing any extra work outside of painting what the kit already gives you. For the straps, you have, again, a multitude of different options. With a vehicle like this, you still had a lot of World War II pattern straps, which would have been made out of leather, but you also had some webbing material straps that were also coming on scene and being used on military vehicles at this time. Generally, the webbing could have been a tan color. It could have been an olive green color. So again, you have quite a few options available to the builder, along with just painting the tools themselves. Regardless on how you paint it, just as long as you paint it, you'll definitely be good to go. Moving along takes us to the siren, and the siren, again, as a kid original, was utilized out of the box, but the one addition I made, just like with the taillights, was I added the power cable. The power cable on this pattern of vehicle will emerge from the rear portion of the siren, it runs along this area over here, and snakes into the vehicle right there next to the MG blister. This is something to think about when you're detailing one of these models and once added again it helps the look overall. Another bit of detailing that interestingly enough was omitted by Dragon are the front supports that are found right here on either side of the front tin work. This is an iconic bit of detailing found on this pattern of vehicle and what's interesting to point out was on the US Marine Corps M26A1 kit, I believe it had these components rendered in plastic with the turnbuckle no less, and they were very nicely rendered. On the M46 here, that was just not the case. They were completely absent. To add that little bit of detailing, the ones you see on this model are fabricated out of thin lengths of metal wire that were flattened on either end and then glued to the appropriate locations. Fortunately for the tin work supports, they were in a couple different options from what I've seen on real surviving vehicles is also period photographs. So you have versions with the turnbuckle, but I've also seen them where it's just a piece of rod iron like you see here, much along the same format. If you add these bits detailing, it again helps the build overall. As for where they connect, well, you can see where they just mount directly to the tin work on this side and where they secure to the vehicles actually on the front lift point right here on either side of the, the front casting. As you can see, once the camera zoomed out, it just completes the look and it fills it out very nicely in my opinion. And while on the topic of the fender supports, here we have the ones found on the back. Like I may have mentioned earlier, these ones here are kit supplied and just simply get utilized out of the box without any problems. Continuing on the top deck area takes us to the engine deck. And as I mentioned before, this is definitely the most important, iconic, and focal point rich area on the entire M46 kit and family for that matter. The engine deck here is exquisitely rendered, as I mentioned before, but now you can see what looks like fully painted and weathered, and it just loves to drink up panel line accents, and when it's fully done, it just looks killer. It's a really nice bit of detailing. 
all the components that you see here are again kit supplied. They went out without any sort of problems. And there was one little upgrade that I made to this model, and that involves the travel lock. Travel lock is the kit original one, of course. However, it's just intended to be glued in place, either in the open or closed state. Well, with a pin vise and with a small little sewing pin, I was able to drill the section out and make it fully functional in the way that you see it here. It's one of those why not pieces of detailing, and once added, gives a nice little bit of functionality to the model. Although, it's not like I could go ahead and display the 90mm in the retracted travel lock state, but you know, hey, it's still pretty cool to have it peacefully functional as it didn't really add all that much extra work to the build. From there, it takes it to the exhaust manifolds, and again, this is probably my favorite part on the M46 family as a whole, just these large, ridiculous, you know, car uh, exhausts that are on steroids. I absolutely love the way they look, and on this model here, they don't disappoint. On the exhaust manifolds themselves, they are very nicely rendered out, being a two-piece assembly. And you can see the weathering work found right there on the exhaust mufflers themselves. And then they have those really cool bent sheet metal heat shields right there on the top. This is something that during the paint and weathering, I do as a one-two punch. The exhaust and the exhaust manifolds are painted separately from one another, so that I go ahead and weather and rust the mufflers themselves completely and then once the mufflers are done the heat shields are weathered off the model and then secured on a place after the main weathering is done this is how i'm able to achieve the double weathered look that you see here where the mufflers themselves are heavily rusted and weathered while the heat shields are you can have the effect of the paint starting to rust out and burn off from underneath it's a nice bit of detailing again adds a bit of character to the build immensely and with the way the Dragon Kid is designed, it's nicely engineered in that you can go ahead and model the vehicle in this format here, and it just goes together very well. Moving along to the front takes us to the side storage boxes. These are, again, the kit originals, and this is something that is probably one of the more tedious aspects of the build. One thing that I did mention earlier is that I love how these kits render out the tin work and the tin work detailing, as all these components are separate molded parts that are individually molded and attached to the hull, much along the lines as the real vehicle. Well, when you're installing the storage boxes here, they go on without any sort of problems, but one thing that is a bit of a fiddly bit of equipment, specifically on the M46 specifically, are with these handles. These are made out of injection molded plastic. They are integrally molded on the sprues, and you have to carefully remove, deburr, and fit them to their appropriate locations, and this is something that is a bit tedious, but once properly done, it definitely makes the model look all that much more detailed in the long run. Same is true, of course, for the opposite side. The way I like to deburr these components is with the clean cut snip, I remove them off of the sprue. Once off the sprue, these are pretty frail, so trying to sand them down with a needle file or with some sandpaper is a bit problematic, and you're inviting yourself to bend and snap the handles in that type of format. So what I like to do is with the clean cut snip, I snip really close to the piece themselves, so it's just a little bit of a burr that's on the surface. Then I secure them to the appropriate locations on the model with the super glue, and once the glue is fully, keyword fully set, I then take some very fine sandpaper, and I just rub it up and down the surfaces here on the top, in a nice even and fluid manner, i.e. you don't want to you know, flatten them completely, so you want to go in a angular type motion. And by doing this, you will slowly but surely deburr the remembrance of those sections off of the, off of the handles. Once the pieces are deburred, you can see at least for the seamless look that we have here. And if you use the format that I mentioned before, where you not just hit the top but the sides as well, you will not get a flat add it to the top portion, which can hurt the look. Instead, you get the appropriate round bars look like you see here on my model. Moving Bauer takes to the front hatches, stock components, nothing much to talk about there. However, the one change that I made from this model compared to the stock original is that these are not the kit supplied brush guards. As I touched upon before, the kit does give you finely molded brush guards, and I could have probably have used them. However, they are so frailly molded that trying to snip them off and deburr them is a bit problematic. So I believe one of them I lost during the process of removal, and then I said to myself, why am I even using these? Because in my stash, I have an entire set of HD 3D printed US AFE brush guards. The 3D printed ones are arguably way better compared to the old school Dragon ones, and even though the Dragon ones did age very, very well, 
the 3D printed ones are a lot better with both the geometry and also with the, the fine faster details that are tightly molded on. So the ones on this model here are the AG 3D printed ones from Shapeways.com. The link I have for these sets are listed in the video description below. These sets are really, really recommended. They give you a ton of brush guards. And if you build a lot of American World War II and even post-World War II tanks as I do, it's a really good investment to have in your stash because they are awesome to add to just about any vehicle from this period. They're nicely rendered, they're nicely detailed, you have a ton of them, and they're also really affordable. I can't recommend that set enough. Moving upward takes to the turret, and as I mentioned before, the turret halves are glued together, and then with the use of thick super glue, I stippled it in order to blend the two halves together and also continuing the rough cast texturing. That technique works really well because it blends in with the molded cast texturing that was present on the surface of the castings like I showed earlier. Well, the turret itself, again, nothing really much going on here. It is all stock. It goes together very, very well. And now that it's fully painted and weathered, you really get to see exactly what the finished outcome looks like. The one area that you do need to do a little bit of hand fitting and a little bit of blending with is with the mantlet rotor and how it connects to the turret casting itself. It goes on pretty well for the most part, but there is a little bit of hand fitting on the bottom portion so that it could fit the circumference of the turret ring. This is something that's easily done with a little bit of hand fitting. A needle file, some sandpaper is really all you need, and once the section is polished down, it fits in place without any sort of problems. Moving forward takes to the mantlet and the 90 millimeter. Nothing much to talk about here. All stock. The mantlet casting is just gorgeous. The tooling is superb, and it basically it's good to go out of the box. Nothing really there to mention. Same is also true for the 90 millimeter. This is a two-piece assembly, which is again quite customarily found on these tank kits, and it's taken care of in the same manner as I touched upon in basically every one of these videos. The only thing required in order to polish it down is some thick super glue applied to the seam areas, and then elbow grease is done to remove the rest. This is utilizing both needle files as well as some fine sandpaper. Once the piece is properly blended away, this is basically the final result that you'll get. The only place where you want to pay attention to, of course, is the muzzle brake, as this is a little bit interesting with its geometry, and so trying to get in there with the tools in order to polish it down is something that takes a little bit of finesse with, but again, nothing that's out of place or it's all that out of uncommon on these plastic tank model kits. Moving forward takes to the mantlet and the 90 millimeter. Nothing much to talk about here. All stock, the mantlet casting is just gorgeous. The tooling is superb, and it basically it's good to go out of the box. Nothing really there to mention. Same is also true for the 90 millimeter. This is a two-piece assembly, which is again quite customarily found on these tank kits, and it's taken care of in the same manner as I touched upon in basically every one of these videos. The only thing required in order to polish it down is some thick super glue applied to the seam areas, and then elbow grease is done to remove the rest. This is utilizing both needle files as well as some fine sandpaper. Once the piece is properly blended away, this is basically the final result that you'll get. The only place where you want to pay attention to, of course, is the muzzle brake, as this is a little bit interesting with its geometry, and so trying to get in there with the tools in order to polish it down is something that takes a little bit of finesse with, but again, nothing that's out of place or it's all that out of uncommon on these plastic tank model kits. Also, while on the mantlet, one thing I want to mention, this is a M46 specific, or generally something you generally see on the M46 as opposed to the Pershings, is with the tube that's found on both the optic and also the coax MG section. On the Pershing, these sections do not have this little bit of equipment in place, and it's just round. If you don't believe me, take a look at your Timia and or Henlong M26. However, on the M46, I believe this was done because of the tarplin, they went ahead and added a tube to both these sections over here in order to add as a standoff from the tarplin. And these bits of equipment are supplied with the Dragon kit. The one here on the optic is the kit original. However, I believe the one for the MG was lost, it flung off the lost party during construction. So I went ahead and fabricated a new one out of a piece of small heat shrink tubing, much along the lines I touched upon before on the brush guards. Once fitted in place though, it definitely does the job quite well. On this side of the turret, we have the iconic spare track rack. The rack itself is the kit original. However, the spare track links are the workable track links that I mentioned before that were the AFE club ones. They were able to be modified and secured into this location over here with very little work. And once fit in place, it just gives some pretty good continuity. The reason why I went with those as opposed to the kit ones is because with the 
end connectors that we have here on the sides. With the Dragon Kit, the end connectors are molded permanently in the straights position. And to add a little bit more extra character and realism to the build, I went with the workable ones because with the workable ones, you can have the end connectors in a pivoted type format, which would be more akin to the real one. Keep in mind, these pieces are hinged and they you know, move around. And so more likely, if you ever see a real one or photographs of a real one, the track links will be more of this type of a configuration compared to the way it's rendered on this stock kit counterpart. So it's really good way to keep continuity. Same is not just true, by the way, for the end connectors, but also for the teeth themselves. If I could go ahead and get it in camera, you can see how the teeth are moving around, or I should say are positioned in a way that's not exactly straight on. And again, this is a way to add a little bit of extra detailing to the build. On the rear portion of the bustle takes to the 50 cal storage equipment. This is all kit stock components and were simply utilized out of box. The pieces are nicely rendered out and go on to their appropriate locations. The one tweak that I made, however, was with the 50 cal storage pencil. The pencil is, again, supplied with the model, has some good geometry to it. However, it is molded solid, which is something that is commonly seen on these plastic models. In order to squeeze out just a little bit of more authenticity and realism, with a Dremel and a small Dremel bit, I simply just drilled this section out through and through the way you see it on the actual vehicle. So it's another little quick little tip to mention on these models, and once done, again, it makes it that much more realistic. Moving up to the turret roof takes to the antenna bases. Now this is where I deviated from the kit. The kit does supply you with two MP65 antenna bases. However, they were not utilized on this model. The stock MP65s in my opinion are a little bit on the underscaled end. So rather than utilizing them, I replaced them with these two cast resin counterparts here that I made copies of from the, believe it or not, old school Tamiya M41 Walker Bulldog. If we rewind a number of videos ago, I actually built a Tamiya M41, and I did an OTR rebuild of an M41, and in those two videos, I mentioned that I made a resin, or I should say a copy of the MP65s that are supplied with that kit. And oddly enough, as old and as primitive of a tooling kit that is, the MP65s are actually excellent. And I made the mold in order to fix the OTR version, but I said in that video that if I ever come across another 135 that can use an MP65, I have the molds on hand. Well, here you can see case in point. The units were utilized and were just mounted to the model that we have here in placement of the original kit ones. Just like with all MP65s, they are painted accordingly where the honey scoop or honey comb, I don't know, whatever that thing is you usually see on, on you know, jars of honey, the, the logo on the graphics, that, you know, looking like object with the grooves in it, that is painted in the amber color that we have here as that would be porcelain on the real unit. The color I utilize is to me a hull red as I often mention in these videos and then to add that nice little glaze sheen to it, a swipe of Tamiya Gloss Lacquer was added. For the top portion, this is actually a flexible bit of material. It's rubber on the real units, so a little swipe of black paint was simply added in place. That's all you gotta do in order to paint and render out an MP65. You'll also see that in this model here, I don't have the remaining of the antennas fitted in place. Those can just plug on and off on the real unit, so on this one here, I just simply omitted them and it doesn't change anything on the build itself. If anything, it makes it easier to put in the clear plastic box once I'm done filming, but that's neither here nor there. On the 50 cal piddle mount that we have here, this one, this unit is not utilized, but as I touched upon before, the Dragon Kit rendered it with the rubber cap present in place. On this model here, I simply just painted the rubber cap to look like, well, rubber, and that's the look that we have presently. If you want to improve it further, you can sand off the cap with a needle file, drill out the section over here, and then this will allow you to mount a second turret mounted MG, either be it another M2HB, or an M1919, but generally whenever they would do something like that, it would be with dual M1919, or I'm sorry, dual M2HBs. From there, it takes to the hatches, and you can see the hatches, again, just kit supplied. I did go ahead and delete the molded in blades for the handles that are found on the model, and I fabricated two new handles out of thin floral wire. Again, a customary mod that I generally make on my builds. The brush guard here is the same HD 3D printed brush guard that I touched upon before. Nothing really much to linger about that. On the 
Cupola, the periscopes I always paint in gloss black. This is a common trick that I always mention. Some people like to go with blue. Me personally, from the vehicles I've seen in person and crawled all over, when the tank is generally buttoned up, it usually has a black appearance like you see here, or at least from my personal experience. Moving along takes to the front portion of the turret, and this is one of the cooler M46 changes that were made specifically in Korea, and that is this combination mount that we have here. This unit does a lot of things. It is first the armored cover for the gunner's periscope, which is located right underneath here. It holds and secures on the vein sight, which you can see right over here. And on top of that, it acts as a 50 cal M2HB pintle mount right over here. The reason why this was done, as opposed to the one found here on the back portion, was this gave the tank commander better access to the M2, which was something that was deemed to be important, specifically in Korea, due to all the Chinese human wave attacks. But that's neither here nor there. Regardless, the kit here does have the components very, very nicely rendered out, complete with all the fasteners, the bulkheads, Everything that would be found on the real units present here on the Dragon One mounts on without any problems, and it's just a nicely engineered piece overall. And while on the topic of nicely engineered components, takes to the M2HB. The 50 cal that we have here is, again, the kit original one. It's mounted on an M23 cradle. And the piece, as I touched upon before, is very, very nicely detailed. I always love these Dragon M2s, and this one here definitely is no exception. The ladder sight is present in the back, which is again something that's generally not really seen on several of the other 135 M2s, and it's a nice little feature found on the Dragon one. The piece is painted in the exact same format that I always mention in these videos, where the receiver and the M2 itself is dry brushed with its worn weathering. The handles are painted to resemble red Bakelite with the same type of hull red and to me a gloss lacquer that I touched upon before with the antennas. And also, the cradle mount is painted. Another trick that I always advocate for is to paint the ammo can a slightly different shade of olive drab compared to the cradle because this adds differentiation and it makes the piece look different as opposed to having everything as one solid color and it tends to just blend in that way. By changing out the color of the ammo can, one, this would be commonly seen in field, but it also just gives that much more extra pop to the model. On that note, I also added the little yellow lettering here, which is always found on ammunition cans. This was just added with a small paintbrush with a little bit of yellow paint, and it just gives the look that there's finely molded information printed or painted onto the ammo can. It's always found on the front portion of the can, like you see here, and it's only found on one side and wouldn't be found on both. Again, once added, you can really see how it just gives that much more extra realism to the model as a whole. And that takes to the paint and the markings, and this is obviously the most important and relevant part of this entire build. The paintwork is very, very intricate on one of these models, and it's something that is very, very different compared to even some very elaborate camouflage patterns that are seen on a number of other tanks. When you're doing a Korean War Tiger face, this is something that takes a bit of skill sets in doing as opposed to even some people out there that are really good with applying ca standard camouflage patterns on German tanks or even modern vehicles. Tiger face, it's a little bit different. It's a lot like painting, well, like a car or just like an artwork as opposed to doing a traditional model. And I'll touch upon that in a second. Starting with the most important part is the base coat. So obviously the entire tank would be painted olive drab prior to the Tiger work being applied. And the olive drop on this one is a new shade of OD that I developed, and I kind of developed it accidentally. The color that we have here was originally designed, or I should say was originally cobbled together for a German build that I recently completed. Go ahead and rewind our clocks back um, a few months. I completed a Dragon Artillery Observation Panther. It had some really cool German long name, but I'm not going to say it right now. I kind of forgot the name of it unless I see it written in front of me. But regardless, when I did that build, I went ahead and cobbled a dark or a, a different type of shade of German Dunkelgrün. And as it turns out, that shade is very, very similar to another shade of olive drab that I personally have seen on several surviving vehicles and also period color photographs. So. You know, that was a happy accident, and just like with all happy accidents, I decided to try it on this one here, and that's the color you see for the base, and as you can see, the base coat of all drab looks excellent. 
Obviously it has had some washes added to it and countershading to bring it up to the condition that we have here, but it looks very different compared to several of the other late World War II and post World War II builds that I've brought on this channel in the past. And I'm definitely gonna be utilizing this color a lot more frequently as time and builds go on. The paint itself I cobbled together and it's again exterior latex, which is something that I always use on my builds and lately it's been Controver a controversial topic, but you know, that's how I build them. You guys like the way I build them? That's how I use it. That's the paint I use. So regardless, um, it looks great on this model over here as it does on my other builds. And that's what I utilize for the base coat. Of course, it's applied via the airbrush and the shading and the fade work and filtering was again also done with the airbrush as well. For the yellow work, this is where this build really becomes special. So the yellow is to me a flat yellow. It's applied with the airbrush. And obviously to do that, the entire model needs to be masked up. Or I should say the hull specifically needs to be masked up. If I take the turret off, you can see exactly the format that the yellow follows. So you don't want to have the yellow get on the engine deck. The engine deck you want to keep in olive drab, but you want to have the yellow progress to the side portions here of the tin work where it ends just before the exhaust manifold. Also on the front portion, it's not all yellow and there's some green right over here. And on this one here, there's some green found on the top portions of the fender. Now, there are lots of different variations of the same paint job. So you can have certain traits here or there, but generally the one thing that they all have in common is that the engine deck is left in olive drab. And also the front area here tends to also be left in olive drab as well. For the turret, this was applied via the airbrush without any sort of masking, and that's how you're able to get that nice cloud effect that you see here. As on the real ones, I believe it was probably applied on with a spray gun, but I wouldn't be surprised they hand painted it on a version or two. And that's with the yellow. Again, the yellow I used was to me a flat yellow, and again, using yellow is a skill set in its own right. Painting yellow has always been a pain in the ass, and you need to be on the ball with the, pro the, the correct consistency and also with the correct PSI. It, it takes a bit to figure out how to paint yellow. It's one of those wacky colors. Anyone that's painted before will tell you, painting yellow is always a pain. So, but fortunately to me, a flat yellow, it's a fantastic color and it does apply very well. I did have to use, I think maybe one or two coats in order to get the opacity that you see here. But regardless, the, to me, yellow was instrumental in that. Once the yellow is applied, it's then time to apply on the stripes. And the stripes are applied via the paintbrush. And the stripes themselves, the black, it's to me a flat yellow. And the white stripes is just white exterior, flat latex white paint. The white and the black are thinned out with just a little bit of water in order to get the proper consistency. And this is where the model can make or break you. If the paint is too thick, you're gonna have brush strokes, it's gonna be thick on the surface, and it's not gonna look good. When it comes to doing a paint job like this, you wanna have that paint as flat as humanly possible. I'm not talking about surface sheen or uh, glossiness. I am talking about physically flat. Like, if you look at the model, you're not gonna see the paint stick up from the surface. And that is the key when you're doing a paint job like this here. So a lot of airplane guys out there, this is something that's generally more traditionally seen on them as there's a lot of really cool paint jobs out there on airplanes and the same rules really apply. Also hot rods too, again, similar type of a painting experience. But if I bring the camera up close and it focuses in, you'll see that the paintwork on the stripes is as flat as humanly possible. And again, this must be done with a paintbrush. You cannot airbrush these things. Paintbrush is the only way to do it. And if you're using a paintbrush, you want to have a nice precision tip paintbrush and make sure, honestly, it's a new paintbrush. This is not the type of thing where you want to have a paintbrush that you've been using for a number of years. It's starting to fray at the ends. No, that's, it's going to not really lead for some good results. For something like this, you want a brand spanking new paintbrush where the tip is nice and pointy, nice and precise. The better the paintbrush, the better the result of your paint pattern will be. As for the stripe layout, this is something that's all done again by hand. I do not pre-draw with a pencil or anything like that. If you are someone that's unsure of yourself with your skills, perhaps that's something you might try. But for me, I just basically had the model. I had some pictures of the real ones and I was basically just 
monkey see monkey do. Fortunately, there's a lot of artistic licensing on there, so you know, there's no set way in stone where the paint job needs to be applied via the stripes. Again, these were applied by hand in real life, so you know, you have some latitude and freedom in that regard. The best way I like is with the white stripes. Again, it just really seals up the deal. I've seen some where the white stripes aren't present, but in my opinion, with the white stripes, it really makes the model look all that much better. And again, there are examples of this vehicle with the stripes in this format. So once the striping is out of the way, it's then time for the most important aspect, and that is the face. And again, this will make or break your Korean Tiger face paint job. So as I mentioned before in the unboxing, the kit does supply you with decals that give you the major aspects, i.e. the paws, the mouth, and the eyes. Also, they give you some extra things like the whiskers, the eyebrows, and even some extra stripes, which was a nice little touch. Albeit a bit anemic, and was almost like, why? Because they only give you like a fraction of the required stripes in order to do the whole tank, but regardless, they give them to you, and I used them all on this model here. This is a bit different compared to that Sherman that I mentioned earlier, where I actually had to paint all of the, the face work. But for this one here, I went ahead and used the decals. And fortunately, the decals on this model here, as I mentioned before, are excellent. These Dragon Kits from the mid-1990s time frame, they just had just some of the best decals I've ever seen on a plastic model kit. But even when the model ages to a certain point, the decals hold up and they are just flawless. The decals are worse like decals, they applied onto the surface. And this is where things got complicated because it wasn't exactly a effortless installation. The decals do go on, that is true. However, the nature of these tiger faces, it's a bit of a task, okay, to put it mildly. So starting with the mouth, with the way the mouth is, it has to be applied to the surface here, and there's a lot of geometry going on here on the front. You have the front blower, you have the curvature, you have the toolbox to work around, and yes, you even have these front toe shackles to, to work with. And trying to get a decal to fit and flow into all these sections over here was not very easy. The decal did crack in some certain locations because of the extreme bends and angles that have to contour around items, and this was something that I did have to work with. The other decals to mention are the paws. These went on fairly easily. However, if you're gonna do the paws, you'll notice that first I paint the section over here black, and then the paw goes over it, giving you the look that, again, is something that has been seen on several real examples. And again, there are several different types of paws that I've seen, from this pattern to ones with the claws in red or striping in red. Lots of variations available, which is great for the builder because you can have like a whole platoon of these and no two can look alike. Same is also true for the mouse too, by the way. As for the eyes, these are the kit supplied decals. They went on and just like with the mouth, there's some interesting curvature on this section over here that the decal needs to work around. Namely, with that divot found on this section here of the Pershing slash Patton mantlet. The other thing that is to mention is that the they appropriately designed a nice hole in the middle of the eyeball over here so it slides onto these two locations over here with over those pipes without there being any problems and that's actually a really good design so once the decals were applied i then went ahead and completely sealed them to the surface by painting the entire model with the vms matte varnish again i typically mention this product in lots of videos for good reason it's an excellent product and on this one here it's absolutely important you must varnish the model prior to even continuing the remainder of the face work so what the varnish does is it secures and and seals it to the paint finish so make sure all the decals are on where they need to go and apply the finish and i even had a oopsie moment while I was applying the paint finish, a chunk of the lower jaw here actually ripped off from the PSI and I was doing this outdoors and the decal landed in the grass covered in varnish and yes, I actually had to carefully pick it up with a toothpick and adjust it on the model while the model was still wet, you know, with the varnish setting. The fact I didn't lose it outright is nothing short of a miracle. So that is something to consider. Once the varnish fully set, I was then had the surfaces ready for the next step. And you will think, well, then you're done. You know, you did the varnish work, that's it. It's, you know, wash your hands, you know, add the paint, the gloss sections and the remainder of the paintwork and you're done. Not on a tiger face, specifically one with the decals. Then it came time to do some revisions. So like I mentioned before, the jaw had some areas where the, the decal was, was 
cracking up and breaking up. I also had some sections where it was missing colors because it has a nice gap over here for the, the rack itself. And also, the jaw section cracked off before and I had to, you know, piece it back together piecemeal and even subdivide it. The fact that I got it done is nothing short of a miracle. Oh, one other thing I negated to mention about the, the mouth, you must pre-paint this area here flat black first before the mouth goes in place. So you basically have to cut the decal out precisely. You carefully line it up on the model, carefully draw it out with a pencil. This is one of the few times I actually use a pencil. And then once you have the parameter set, you paint that section with a paintbrush again by hand with, to me, a flat black. That's watered down, of course. Then the decal goes on, then you seal it. Now, going back to what I was saying before, in order to refine the decal with flat, to me, a flat red, and also with that same exterior flat house paint, or white house paint, I went ahead and carefully refined it further, okay? And this included both adding the teeth, touching up little sections, and basically completing the look where it was missing on certain locations like the toolbox. On the eyes, they were able to be sealed onto the model pretty well, but for some reason around the edging, it could have used a little bit of improvement. And this was done with, to me, a flat black. I simply just made a stroke around this section right there where the decal meets the yellow, leaving it for the look that you see here. Once the decals, or I should say, once the hand painting was dry, it received a second coat of varnish to further flatten out all of the paintwork that I did, leaving it for the result that you have here. So, this is a very, very, very elaborate paint scheme and requires a lot of work, more work than most people may anticipate for something like this. But that's just the, how it goes for these Korean War Tiger faces and the juice is always worth the squeeze. Would I do it again? Hell yeah, I do it again. I'm definitely gonna be doing it again because I have a bunch of other tanks in the lineup that, spoiler alert, are Korean War Tiger face. As for what they are, well, we're just gonna have to watch the channel now. So outside of the other stuff that I just mentioned, the remainder of the decals, again, are just so good in their quality that they went on and lacquered on, or I should say varnished on perfectly. These would include like things like the whiskers here. These are the kit supply whiskers. They're great. The eyebrows, kit supplied, excellent. Even the little tiger stripes, they held, they survived and they just came out very well. The only thing I had a problem with was with the mouth and obviously I went ahead and adjusted that with the paintwork. So that's really all there is with the tiger face. And again, my opinion, totally the juice is worth the squeeze and even the quality again of the decals are excellent. There's not really any silvering or any other type of shine that is typically plaguing some poor quality decals out there. They're just great. And considering that these decals here are pushing 30 years old, I mean, there's nothing really much more you can ask for in terms of a water slide decal. And the end result is definitely stunning. However, I'm not done yet with the paint work because once the tiger face was applied, it then went into weathering. And that's when it just the yellow areas received its own filtering, dry brushing, counter shading in order to make it look to the appearance that we have here. So again, and then yes, they received yet another coat of varnish. So this model has been coated probably about three times with the VMS. And again, I would change absolutely nothing. And I look forward to do my next Tiger Face tank, which I may have already completed and waiting to be filmed in the lineup. You'll have to see what that is. Uh, as for the remainder of the weathering, of course, it's my usual format with the exhaust soot right here on the back. And of course, I an M46. The exhaust soot is definitely something that looks cool because the exhausts are so close to the rear tin work over here. And it's always fun going in there with the airbrush, adding little poofs to the appropriate locations. Of course, I touched the, uh, or I touched upon the, the rusty look on the mufflers themselves. And because the M46 is a gasoline powered vehicle, you do have some oil spillage right here on the two fuel caps. And this is done in my usual format with a little bit of black and some gloss. Give you that nice sweaty gasoline sheen right over there, which is, you know, typically seen if ever you have to top off a fuel tank on a large piece of heavy equipment. So, and that's really all there is to that. In the end, well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I should say, screw it. In the end, I just love how this tank turned out. It's awesome. I love tire faces. Well, I already gave away the ending before in the previous scene, but in the end, I am thrilled, absolutely thrilled in how this one turned out. This really was a 
absolute blast of a build to work on. I enjoyed it from the moment I cracked open the box to the second I put on the last brush stroke. This build was just a pleasant build and it was one that was a forbidden fruit that I always wanted to add to my collection. As I mentioned earlier, the Dragon M46 was a really cool model. I always lusted over it, but I kept away from it, sadly, like the plague, because, again, of the individual Lincoln Lake tracks. Fortunately, that has been corrected. Balance has been brought back to the universe, and the tank is a very welcome, welcome addition to my collection. Obviously, this is the perfect point to pivot us into skill level and recommendation. And I'm just going to come out and say it. If you're a beginner, stay away. Nope, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Do not dare try one of these kits. It's not for you. This kit here is a advanced builder kit. An intermediate can definitely tackle it. An advanced builder is definitely more or less something that this is geared to. Uh, by the way, with the caveat, I cannot stress this enough, that you change out the tracks. With the kit supply tracks, the kit's unbuildable. I'm sorry, I don't care what anyone says. If anyone says otherwise, that's pure cope. Individual Lincoln Line tracks are a cancer, they're trash, and they ruin every single model. Fight me, okay? Um, if you change out the tracks, however, with some kind of a workable option from one maker or another, this will make the model transform into something that is not just buildable, but will be a very gorgeous addition to add to your collection. So... A intermediate builder, yeah, they could definitely tackle it outside of the tracks. The wild card again is the tracks. By going with a workable track link option, this will add a level of complexity to the build that some inter that some intermediate builders might not necessarily have the skill levels for. If they do, and depending on the track uh, aftermarket solution that you choose, this may be something that will make the build easier compared to some others. There is the other caveat that if you pick up the Dragon re-release of the M46 from the 2010s time frame, that one is definitely something that I would recommend to a intermediate builder all day long because they went ahead and alleviated the track problem by giving you the DS tracks. DS tracks are awesome. Don't listen to any of those elitist snobs out there to tell you otherwise. There are, it's, it's funny how some people think that they're crap. That's not the case. I wish Dragon would utilize DS tracks on all of their models. It'd make my job a hell of a lot easier and also a bit cheaper. But regardless, that one there, yeah, I would definitely recommend that for an intermediate builder or an advanced builder all day long. An advanced builder obviously has a skill level to tackle one of these models with or without the, the DS track. And it's definitely something that, again, I cannot recommend enough. As I've already touched upon several times in this video, this kit here really did age like wine. And that's, not, again, not just true for this one, but it's also relevant for the other two M26 kits that were released by Dragon. These kits have some magic to them. There must have been a muse or somebody who was working with the designer, and they just hit a home run. These kits are so future-proof that, honestly, again... Fast forward 30 years later, 30 years later, they are still as relevant today as they were when they were first released in the mid-1990s. On top of that, there's not really a whole lot of options out there on the market. And unlike some of the other kits that I mentioned on this channel that they're old, and, but they're still relevant, however they start showing their age, with this one here, that's not the case. As old as this kit is, the tooling is still perfectly fine for today. I mean, you can have some fantastic results with this model, and it really is a testament to just how good this kit really was. On top of that, uh, spoiler alert, I do have the TACOM 135th scale M46 in the stash, and it's going to be interesting to build that one and square the two off side by side. However, just from looking on the internet, and also just looking at some of the sprues that I have, you know, had the opportunity to glance at, it's basically going to be a wash, more or less, with the old Dragon one here. And again, it's just a testament to just how good this kit really was. And again, Dragon, whoever, if you're watching this and if you're the person who designed this kit back in the day, dude, hats off to you, man. You freaking crushed it. It's a beautiful kit. It really is. And this is a perfect point to pivot us into recommendations. Obviously, if you're a fan of American armor, this kit here I cannot recommend enough. Korean War armor, absolutely. freaking lootly This tank is a gorgeous addition to have to your collection, just with the variety of the vehicle type and also just the paint pattern itself. These Tiger Face vehicles never disappoint. They're just gorgeous, and it's a very unique little piece of American history, 
and sadly it's probably one that we're not going to see again. I don't know, there's, lately the army's been doing some wacky things with their M1s, so it'll be kind of cool if one day you see some M1s painted with the Legacy Tiger face. That'll be pretty dope, actually. You know, if anyone's out there is watching this, any company commander, yeah, uh, maybe on Korea, hey, why not, right? Uh, they, they have painted some of their M1s back in off-drab with some stars on them, but uh, yeah, that'll be kind of cool if anyone out there could do that to their M1s. Hey, I'll gladly build a Model 1 and post it on, on the YouTube channel. Uh, outside of that, again, Korean War, absolutely. American armor fans, absolutely. If you're a fan of the Patton family, well, the M46 is the very first Patton family vehicle. It was literally the vehicle I coined the name, Patton, and then after this, it was just M47, M48, and technically M60, even though it's not a Patton, but I'm digressing. Regardless, if you're a Patton fan, this kit here, definitely. It's, it's a very beautiful kit, and you will not regret having it to your collection. And on a similar note, if you're a fan of the M26 Persian family, this kit here would definitely be a great addition, as even though it's not a Persian family vehicle, in my opinion, the M46 Patton really should have been the M26A2. I mean, seriously. It's basically the same vehicle, just a different engine. But regardless of that, if you have the two versions from Tamiya or the other versions from Hobby Boss and the other companies out there, the Dragon M46 Patton, definitely something to check out. Also, because of the interesting subject matters, namely with the paint job that we have here, it would be a great contender for use on a diorama setting. You could definitely cobble together a nice interesting scene with the vehicle in the following format in a multitude of different configurations. The kit would also be good for anyone who's just, well, a fan of collecting vintage plastic tank kits. The Dragon M46 kit here is a vintage kit, absolutely. Even though it builds extremely well and it's just as relevant today, that doesn't take away the fact that it is a 30-year-old kit. And if you're the type of person out there that likes to build and collect all these old vintage kits, like, well, yours truly, this kit here would be a great addition to add to your collection. As I stated before, there were three of these kits that were released. We had the T2063, the M26A1, and this one here, the M46. And if anyone's taken head count, so far I've done two of the three. I'm missing the Dragon T26, and that is something I'm probably going to have to track down now, just so that I could finally have a nice end cap to that collection. But to quote Meatloaf, hey, two out of three ain't bad. The kit itself is also fairly adaptable. As I touched upon earlier, you can build this kit in one or two configurations. Obviously, I went with the Tiger Face format here, but the kit does have that really cool version with the searchlight, specifically for the U.S. Marine Corps configuration. And again, that's another, well, another person who I'd recommend this kit to if you're a fan of USMC armor. The M46 Patton was definitely utilized by that branch. And... Well, it's actually quite tempting to track another one of these kits down to build it with that format. Uh-oh. Looks like I gotta hit up eBay. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Finally, I'd recommend this model to anyone who's a fan of the Tiger Tanks. <laughs> it's a, not exactly the type of Tiger Tank that most people think of when they think of that vehicle, but technically, specifically in this configuration, it's a Tiger Tank. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's more or less being a troll more than anything. But regardless, if you have the painting skills, one of these Korean War tanks never disappoints. They're just fantastic builds all, of them, all in all. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale Dragon M46 Patton Medium Tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop a new post of content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.